Um, next up, we have a uh, talk from John Cole. And John Cole is the co-founder of Hyperlane. And he's going to be talking to you today about building the interchain highway. So he's going to talk about the state of blockchain interoperability and how Hyperlane intends to drive it forward. Thank you so much, John, for joining us. I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Of course. Thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's really great to be here, especially coming on after that uh, great panel and having uh, most people finish up by talking about kind of what they want to get out of XCM was uh, very, very relevant. So really glad to be here. So you look at the slide title, right? Like building the interchain highway. What the hell does that mean? Uh, so Here's a, an image form, what stable diffusion thought it meant, but a little bit more seriously. So in this talk, I'm going to tell you about what we're working on in Hyperlane. Uh, and Hyperlane is what we're trying to build. The It's, in our view, the modular uh, interoperability platform. And we're trying to build this thing we call the interchain highway, uh, what we view as being the way to navigate the interchain space. So to pull it on in place, we should start with where we are today. And let's talk about the state of blockchains. So everyone here kind of has a good enough understanding about what these are, right? We have these amazing internet computers. Functionally, they're just all state machines. Um, they're creating loads of valuable state in all of our combined interactions, right? All the builders that you've heard uh, talk about today, all their apps, all those users are combining to create so much um, valuable and useful state. But, you know, without something like... Um, in our operability network without like a fully rob you know, totally robust uh, XCM protocol, that state can't really be accessed by these different chains. And if you're talking about being on a different environment, so that valuable state might as well be in a different galaxy. And if you think about deploying on multiple chains as an app developer, what you're talking about now is really just adding more, uh, adding more fragmentation. You're creating instances of your app instances that might share a brand, but unfortunately they don't share any of the uh, blood, sweat and tears that you've put into your app before to generate, whether it's liquidity, some form of tangible network effect. The key point is that the next instance of your app on another chain does not uh, benefit from everything you've done before. Instead of augmenting what you have, it's adding fragmentation. Additionally, we're in the state in crypto right now where if you think about the steps that you go through as an end user, think about how many times how many times you end up interfacing and interacting with what should be backend infrastructure. And you go through all of these hoops just to arrive at an application that you want to arrive at. No, no even semi-mature technology looks like that. We wouldn't really find it acceptable in any other case. In crypto for myriad reasons, uh, I like to think that a big part of it is because us as early adopters, we've reaped many rewards by interacting with all these uh, bits of infrastructure. We find it acceptable, but the next billion users certainly wouldn't, right? To, to really summarize where we are in crypto today is comparable to if iOS and Android existed as like completely separate ecosystems that had no functional uh, communication between them. Imagine a world where Uber drivers on Android can't pick up riders on iOS and vice versa. No one would find this acceptable. And so we know this isn't the end state. We want a different state. Like, what does it look like? How do we get there? So let's think about our destination, right? This, this uh, yearned for end state. From our perspective, it's a world where blockchains are sim seamlessly connected where all applications are what we'd call interchain applications. We're going to talk a lot about these in this presentation, where users interact with apps while needing, at best, just minimal knowledge of the underlying infrastructure, where it just all kind of works, right? Um, here at Hyperlane, we like calling this the interchain singularity. This is a point from which there's no turning back to single monolithic chains, no turning back to just being OK with having to navigate so much infrastructure. So we think this is going to require interconnected apps, right? These interchain apps that I just mentioned. These were these are contracts that are aware of their counterparts and other state on separate chains. We're at a Moonbeam event today. Moonbeam is pretty big on the concept of connected contracts. What we call interchain apps, what Moonbeam calls co connected contracts, they are basically one and the same. It's really nearly exactly the same concept. 
So how do you do that though? To do that, you need to connect the underlying chains where the app is going to be deployed on, right? Without doing that first, it's just not going to work. So at Hyperlane, we are creating a network of networks, a network between blockchains and the way to traverse that network. And we call the way to traverse that network, the interchain highway. Uh, we're trying to build the most accessible, the fastest, the most secure paths for applications to take between blockchains. Uh, a little tidbit, if you're a Star Wars fan, you might recognize that we kind of stole the name from the franchise. Uh, in that galaxy far, far away, a hyperlane is the safest and fastest route between uh, different star systems. So hopefully Disney won't mind, but so far they've been okay with it. So as we're going to get further into it, I think it'll pay us uh, some dividends to examine uh, previous eras of interoperability. Or actually, I shouldn't say previous. We should just examine what's happened to lead us to where we are today, the efforts that have come before uh, before today, and the concept of errors might be a bit misleading simply because none of these have ended. So you'll look at the slide and you'll notice that there are year markers on these three different points, uh, but there's no end dates. There's no end dates very intentionally because all three of these modes or eras are all playing out at the same time. Uh, None of them are invalid. They're all just different, and they all have different modes of expression. Uh, here, probably we're most familiar with what at Hyperlane we've been calling defined rule set interoperability. Think of this as uh, basically what you get with, um, with XCMP and the collator, uh, or what you would get with IBC and the Cosmos world. You are offered interoperability within a set structure. You can build a parachain or an IBC compliant chain, and you're going to get very, very good interoperability guarantees as long as you're operating within this set of compliant blockchains. Um, try to go out of it and now you start running into difficulties because the guarantees are only upheld as long as you fit the rule set. So the most common form of expression here are uh, pair chains or app chains or really just application specific chains. They don't have to be application specific but they seem to be uh, the most common. And the mode of interoperability, again, is focused on blockchains communicating between each other. How is it going? Again, we're at a Moonbeam event. It's going pretty well, right? Uh, parachains, Cosmos app chains, they've had a real resurgence uh, over the last 12 to 18 months. And uh, the trend is certainly pointing upwards, right? Like that what used to be a pretty, um, I'd say off the beaten path or maybe like a fringe belief, this app chain thesis, it is now materializing big time. So that started around 2015 and 2016. And within a few years, by late 2019, early 2020, we started seeing the emergence of this asset centric uh, mode of interoperability. This is all about interoperability designed to enable users to move assets between compatible chains. Uh, What's the most common mode of expression here? Well, pretty obvious, it's bridges. These have been the most dominant form of expression. Whether it's cross-chain swapping protocols like Synapse or wrapped asset bridges like Wormhole, and obviously there are, there are others that we can and might want to mention, but just in the interest of time, we won't. And like, if you think about how this one's going, well, there's been billions, uh, tens of billions of dollars really. Uh, of assets and transaction volume that happened via this mode of interoperability. So it's going fairly well. On the other hand, there has been an unfortunate number of incidents, both in their size and their just actual occurrence that relate to this mode of interoperability. But before we go on to the next one, the most important takeaway from both of these eras is that in both cases, the burden of interoperability has been placed on the user. Now, again, not that this is wrong or invalid, it just is. And for the first time, this is beginning to change as we shift into this new era. What's happening in this new era of app-centric interoperability? Now we are shifting the burden um, of interoperability from users to applications. It's less, uh, it's less going to be about a user uh, interacting with, say, something like a bridge to move asset A to the chain they want to be on because the app they like exists on that chain. And it'll be much more about the app meeting them where they are. So it's still 
assets are still moving around. There's still movement and information and logic being transferred between chains. There's still state being accessed and written. But the way that this happens, who's doing what, who is tasked with, with what, uh, is what's changing. And the most uh, important takeaway here is that it's about putting the back end in the back and surfacing the applications to the front. And as we think about what are going to be the dominant forms of expression here, well, as the most nascent of these eras, it's really hard to tell, but certainly Hyperlane, of course, we're biased. We think their interchain applications are going to be the dominant form of expression here. Uh, and as I mentioned before, right, like everything is going to be handled by the application as an, and an end user will just be facing that application from the chain they already have an account on while the other parts of the process are abstracted away. So with some of the history covered, we can probably move forward to where we're going uh, now that we've talked about how we got here. So the interchain highway, right? The road that's gonna lead us to, our des to that destination, the interchain singularity that we talked about before, that point where everything just works. So let's tell you more about Hyperlane. In recent years, you've seen a lot of people uh, take the approach that we should solve blockchain problems with more blockchains. Nothing wrong with that, but not what we're trying to do here. Hyperlane isn't another blockchain to solve your blockchain problems. Hyperlane connects blockchains. Our smart contracts and our uh, and our agents create a network between networks. So, so you can think of it as a network of networks. Um, and we call that, again, the interchain highway. So how does it work? You're, if you're... If you're interested in by now this is the right time to ask like how the hell does this thing work it sounds it sounds interesting but like tell me more uh, so it's implemented in smart contracts um, and as we said before there's no need to introduce another mail uh, another blockchain into the mix so we have our mailboxes uh, an outbox and an inbox they exist on every chain where hyperlane is deployed now for uh, for context sake you should know that within a few weeks uh, these will no longer be separate contracts. There will just be one mailbox that contains the functionality of an outbox and inbox, but it does make it easier to speak about as uh, separate instances. And the most important takeaway is that these mailboxes, they function as the on-chain API that a developer would interface with. So if you're a user, whether that's an application contract or an end user, they interface with the outbox. You send your message through it. A message contains its destination or destinations and it contains the uh, the message body, which those are just the arbitrary bytes you're passing along. You could execute a function, you could move an asset, you could do both or any mix of them, or you could do something as frivolous as uh, sending a, uh, you know, a string over of, hey, John, how you doing? But probably don't want to pay gas for that. Uh, I'll leave that to you. So you sent your message, and now it's added to an incremental Merkle tree. Uh, that Merkle tree keeps up the contract state uh, of, of that mailbox contract. Now is when uh, the, the first instance of security comes in, the validators. Hyperlane validators provide economic and reputational security. They observe the outbox. Once the message look valid in the sense that it's uh, it's finalized, it's it's not going to get reorged out, they, uh, they will sign the root of that Merkle tree that we just mentioned. And also you should note that these validators are unique to each chain and their stake lives on each chain uh, that they're validating from. So a single validator does not observe X many chains or say, let's say eight many eight chains. They observe one chain and they have a stake specific to that chain. One entity can run many validators, but their stakes will be uh, separated and they will have maintained different sets of keys. This is very, very important because it means that Hyperlane has verifiable prod proofs and permissionless slashing. This is a fairly rare property that can only be achieved by having validators unique to each blockchain. We could spend an hour talking about um, the benefits of that. If you want, you, I'll, I'll leave my contact info at the end and uh, feel free to, to reach out. But so we're, we're halfway there with how Hyperlane works. Now come in the relayers. These are permissionless role, uh, permissionless agents, a role that anyone can operate Several uh, Hyperlane applications are already experimenting with running their own relayers. And so there's no blockade to anyone doing it. Uh, relayers observe the outbox as well, just like the validators. 
And what they're looking for are messages that are already finalized and completed with sufficient, uh, with sufficient signatures. And they're going to collect any fees uh, that are paid up by the message sender. And then they'll move to the relevant inboxes and initiate the, the message processing. That's where signatures are going to be proved against. Once the signature is approved against, assuming there's a sufficient amount of valid signatures, that message is ready for the final stage of processing. And this, right now, that's where the interesting uh, innovation, like where the real, the, the most interesting part about Hyperlane, sovereign consensus, comes in. This is what we believe sets Hyperlane apart from any other player in the interoperability landscape. This is an app-specific layer of security that allows applications to configure their security model uh, from either choosing from or creating their own uh, what we'd call interchain security modules. Remember, we called it the modular interoperability platform, and sovereign consensus is the most evident expression of this modularity. What this means is that as the application developer, you could do something as simple as requiring your own designated uh, signers to be included, or no message can be processed, or as nuanced as adding optimistic security. Uh, sovereign consensus was designed to uh, be this kind of flexible extension of security, allowing you to, uh, to stay up to date with innovations in, the, in security models, because as we know, crypto is very evolutionary and you're gonna need new defense mechanisms uh, because there's always increasingly sophisticated predators that put, uh, put our security models to shame. And so we don't wanna have a case where a certain security model is made obsolete because of the progress of the interest uh, of the industry. So the most interesting thing you can do with sovereign consensus is that you could set security, uh, you could configure it in a dynamic way based on user uh, user actions in the context of those actions. So you imagine a transaction moving around three dollars and a transaction moving around a hundred million dollars. Well, the three dollar one, you might just want the fast path and send that through just economic security but something like a non-figure transaction, you might want to have that go through an optimistic, uh, an optimistic security module with a 12-hour challenge period, giving everyone the, the opportunity to examine that transaction and make sure that nothing malicious is happening with it. Uh, this has never been done before in the field of interoperability, where to date, every platform basically uh, has its developers opt in to a singular security model, and they get that security model at all times, irrespective of any context. So I am about to run out of time. So let's talk a little bit about what's interesting with Hyperlane and what's new here. So there's sovereign consensus, which we just touched on. There are the interchain applications, which we mentioned before, and more on those in the next slide. There are uh, a couple new features that we just launched, like interchain accounts and interchain queries. These are very similar to their IBC counterparts. In fact, here at Hyperlane, we like to extend IBC concepts to environments broader than just the Cosmos ecosystem. So interchain accounts allow you to control contracts uh, from a single chain without ever having to, or sorry, to control addresses from a single chain without ever having to deploy contracts on any different chains. And queries allow you to verify information on remote chains so you can act upon it. A little bit more on interchain um, applications. We, we see a bunch of these already being built and we think there's some very, very exciting use cases here like uh, applications to uh, have interchain control of governance, uh, interchain stable coins and CDPs where you could have uh, CDPs on on chains, on remote chains, accepting native assets uh, as the collateral and minting natively interchain stable coins that can move around between any chain on the Hyperlane network with ease. Uh, interchain lending, the concept of being able to borrow against collateral that might exist on a different chain. And last, the one I'm most excited about is this idea of smart blockchain smart routing, where Hyperlane would allow you effectively to turn any, any network, any blockchain environment into your own layer two um, by routing computations to it and seeing those executed and kind of batching state back whenever you needed to access it. Um, so with that all said, uh, I'll leave some of my contact info here. Uh, you know, you can find us on Twitter at hyperlane underscore XYZ or main websites, hyperlane.xyz. You can find me on Twitter if you'd like uh, or join our Discord. Don't hesitate to reach out. 
we are uh, very happy to, you know, we, we support our developers quite often are very happy to help in any way that we can. This was wonderful, John. And uh, you explained everything very succinctly and clearly. And uh, we're so excited to have you participate in the Illuminate Hackathon kicking off next week. Exactly. We'll see you there. So if you're hacking, uh, we'd love to hear from you. And thanks again. Cheers.